I've just spent 14 hours traveling in one of these new capsule sleeper trains, which are Austria's innovative and slightly bizarre new addition to the European night train market. I had high hopes when I first heard of the private sleeping pod concept and I was looking forward to trying it out, but my assumption that traveling in them two months after they came into service would mean that any teething problems had been fixed turned out not to be true. The new setup has pros and a few very annoying cons that I hadn't expected, which made it not a great night and left me finding it pretty hard to recommend that you travel this way, particularly when you hear the cost and it seems like I'm not alone because as it turns out the ticket prices have sparked more than a little controversy. My journey started to the surprise of absolutely nobody with a delay on the German railways as my journey up to Hamburg where these new night trains leave from was delayed by over an hour. Thankfully I know to expect these things by now so I'd set off so early that not even Deutsche Bahn could ruin my connection onto the night jet and if you've ever been to the station here in Leipzig you know that it's not the worst place to get stuck for a bit. Thankfully my train did come in the end and keep in mind that while I was taking it to Hamburg Hauptbahnhof or main station, it did actually continue to Hamburg Altona. That name is going to come up again in a minute. When booking my reservation, I had said that I didn't mind whether they put me in an upper or lower capsule, but my ride up to Hamburg gave me enough time to look into this in more detail now that more pictures and reviews are out. And I suddenly found myself very much hoping that they'd assigned me an upper one since I couldn't see any way of getting in and out of the lower bunks with any dignity. I didn't know at this point that I would end up being assigned an upper bunk, but I also needn't have worried because my long legs can find a way to make an undignified dignified entrance just about anywhere. The new night jet capsules, which they call mini cabins, aren't running on every line yet and so far only connect two Austrian cities, Innsbruck and Vienna, with Hamburg. I chose the route southbound to Innsbruck partly because I'd never been there before and partly because I was hoping for some alpine views in the morning. So my mini cabin would be whisking me a thousand kilometers through the entire length of Germany until just over the Austrian border all while I supposedly slept. Hamburg greeted me not only with the cold, but also with the news that the night train itself would be delayed. Aside from extending my wait time in the freezing cold main station, which, sorry not sorry, is definitely not comparable to Leipzig's, there. I said it. I was actually very forgiving of this delay. Assuming that we couldn't make it up overnight and would therefore arrive in Innsbruck later, that just meant that more of the mountainous stretch between Munich and Innsbruck would be in the daylight, which would lead to a more scenic breakfast in bed. See. If you don't have a specific need to be somewhere on time, you can always find a positive spin to put on something like this. The train kept getting more and more delayed as confirmed by the app and many, many in-station announcements, but it did eventually arrive to scoop us all up from the cold platform. I climbed aboard ready to walk down the carriage only to notice that my mini cabin number 74 was actually the very first one. This would come back to haunt me later, but for now, my home for the night was giving me very good first impressions. You're given a card by the train staff, which not only opens the door to your cabin, but also opens a locker for your bags and coat, which is a very nice feature and even a separate one for your shoes. You'll also receive a pillow, a blanket and a sheet which since this isn't the top tier first class accommodation you get to put on your mattress yourself. Having attempted that just once I can absolutely relate to the idea that no train staff wants to go down the entire carriage making up all of these cabins. There's no space to maneuver inside the cabin and the aisle is full of lots of other people trying to do the same thing so I eventually gave up and settled for it looking like this. So yeah forgive me but hey that's what you come here for realism and non-aesthetic linen situations. My main surprise so far was that the guy below me was actually already sat up comfortably in his bed reading, and it was then that I checked the timetable again and realized that these trains actually depart from Hamburg Altona, where I very easily could have gone to to get on first. If you want to be more like that guy, just make the short ride around there to get on in peace before the main station chaos. Seeing this in real life and realizing that a company went and designed and built this setup with all these sleeping pods and in integrated secure luggage storage is pretty mad at first. When we get into ticket prices, you might agree with me that it's not worth what they're charging, but climbing in and sitting in this private capsule for the first time, knowing that it was going to transport me to another country, did absolutely impress me, and I have to give my respect to the people who came up with it. It did all feel and even smell very new and clean, and it was so cool sitting up in my own private space. Up at this end, you have a little window with two options for how dark you want the blinds to be, a European power socket and USB port, as well as even a wireless charger. This panel lets you see if the toilet is currently occupied or not, which I thought was pretty nice, as well as giving controls for dimming the lights and even changing their colour for some reason. This fold-out table is also a really nice feature. You can slide it through the cabin to wherever you want it to be, and the underside doubles up as a mirror. Now, I would actually tend towards booking the lower bunk next time, purely because up here, while there's still a lot of headroom, the curvature of the top of the train doesn't allow you to sit up straight, which looks like a very small difference on video, but actually made it pretty uncomfortable. Still, there's enough room to accomplish such activities as pretending to read German National Geographic while filming yourself, and 
pretending to work on a laptop while filming yourself. There's also this little space to keep things next to your bed while you sleep, behind which you can find this collapsible red divider. If the people on both sides unlock this dial, you can actually open this up so that you can talk or share a drink with the person in the bunk next to you if you're traveling with a friend. Even ignoring the generous assumption that people who travel in this way have friends, this struck me as a little bit weird, because it compromises the otherwise fairly convincing illusion that you're traveling in your own space, divided from other passengers by solid barriers, by having this more flimsy barrier right between your face and that of a stranger, but it wouldn't be my neighbour on that side that I had to worry about. I was in the very first mini cabin in the carriage, which I presume is because I booked so early and they just fill them sequentially. This meant that on the other side of me, I had one of the bigger shared sleeping rooms. Now this probably normally wouldn't represent a problem, but this time it was occupied by a group of blokes who were clearly heading off on some kind of ski holiday down in Austria. I had seen them hauling ski gear and suitcases and crates of beer onto the train and I should have seen it coming, but their constant talking, shouting, laughing, slamming their compartment door on the way to go out to use the bathroom, knocking on the compartment door for some reason before slamming it again on the way back in, would end up being the soundtrack to my sleepless night. I went down to the bathroom myself, which was at this point pretty nice and clean, definitely a brand new installation, and got ready for bed. Laying down in the capsule, I could just about stretch out, which is a pretty nice luxury. I'm what the Europeans call 183 centimeters, and fully stretched out with my head right up against this end, my feet would only just hit the far wall. So if you're any taller than me, you might have to scrunch up a little bit. It was generally pretty comfortable, but the first thing stopping me from falling asleep was definitely the pillow. It was so small and flimsy as to be properly useless to me, and I ended up having to go back into my locker to get some clothes to put underneath it to try and bolster it a little bit. I still wasn't properly able to to sleep for some reason and I would say if you added it up over this entire night I got less than two hours of sleep which I'm not going to completely blame on the pillow and the drunks surely some of it has to be my own fault or just bad luck in the cabin you are actually pretty isolated from hearing train noise or being rocked around so I would guess that most people were able to sleep more on board although I must admit that the temperature situation was not helping you do have air conditioning but there's no control in the cabin it seems like it's controlled centrally and whatever I did with this vent in the cabin I just could not get comfortable I had both periods on this journey of laying awake and sweating and laying awake and shivering, which is something that generally only ever happens in the same night when you've got the flu. Probably not a comparison you were expecting when you clicked on this video, but here we are. A lot of these things I can see them improving as they gather more feedback because it would be such a shame given all the work that must have gone into bringing this to market if they didn't just make those 10% little final tweaks that could quite easily leave people coming away with better memories of a good experience on board. Eventually the sun started to rise and I accepted my fate as a rough looking, rough feeling, sleep deprived man and sat up, eagerly awaiting the breakfast shaped morale booster that would shortly be dropped onto my table. My two rolls with apricot jam and this coffee definitely meant that even if I wouldn't arrive in Innsbruck well rested and ready to go, I would at least arrive well fed, which was a nice treat, even if I had very visibly annoyed the guy who dropped my breakfast off by not having an empty tray ready for him to take away again within 15 seconds. Which is where I sadly find myself mentioning the staff on board, which I absolutely never do because it must be such an exhausting job, but I hope that in this case you understand why I include it, just to demonstrate why there were a few reasons that the atmosphere on board the train was not such a nice place to spend time in. There was just a weird amount of bickering between the staff and the other passengers, even from when I very first got on in Hamburg, I didn't pay much attention to it because I was figuring out my own cabin, but it seemed like they weren't very receptive to helping other passengers get to grips with the new setup. And there was some disagreement over whether it was possible to order food and drinks in the evening, which is advertised online and in some other reviews, but seemed for us, um, not to be the case. Yeah, there was just a lot of weird uneasy vibes on board, which are generally pretty easy to ignore. And hey, I had my own private space on this train. A guy dropped off a breakfast and a coffee into my cabin while I was watching the mountains go past. This was still a very privileged Sunday morning. But then came the sudden decision that they urgently, like right this second, needed our bedding back. And that was not very popular. There was just loads more bickering to be overheard as the train staff went around banging on people's cabin doors, demanding that they give their bedding back. And the customers tried to protest that hey we still have two hours left to go and I wanted to have a nap before Innsbruck and I've paid a lot for this. Although grumpy staff can sometimes take the sheen off of travel experiences it's not something that I ever ever mention because I know that I would be so much more grumpy if I worked that job. You know being up all night and away from your family all the time and stuff like serving food and drinks on board is always liable to get cancelled anyway so I was going to leave all of that unsaid. Until I saw this video from one of my favorite German YouTubers who traveled on the same route and noted the exact same awkward moments. Dann Service. Service war leider nicht so gut. And I just, 
I do find it interesting how two people who used this service anonymously on a random day had this same experience, which is so different from a lot of other reviews that you can find online, which you'll see are mostly by people who were invited by the train company to go on the inaugural journey and make videos about it. So obviously everything was all shiny and professional and friendly and media ready on that day because that's marketing day, and then the standards slip very quickly. That, by the way, is a slight on the train company and absolutely not on any YouTubers or travel writers who get invited to go on these types of journeys, who do great work reporting on things, how they find them, and of whom I am not at all jealous. The same person also mentions having spent 130 euros on this journey, the exact same amount as I paid. And it wasn't worth that, it just wasn't. But, 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 but it is only fair to mention that when researching for this video, I was able to find mini cabins at a huge range of prices like 140, 185, and even 65 euros, which is when I came across the great Nightjet pricing algorithm drama. <laughs> yes, this is a real thing. Much has been written on this topic and Obebe staff have actually had to give interviews and make statements where they admit that they sell the exact same tickets over a huge range of prices now. People seem to be really mad that the ticket prices have such high top ends now and accuse them of basically price gouging their customers. I think it's just another advantage to being flexible and taking the time to try and dig up one of the cheap fares. Because yeah, if you did do this for 65 euros, suddenly at least half of my complaints just vanish into the wind. My more positive spin on the whole thing is that I find it pretty amazing that Obebe and Nightjet have even gone and made something like this. It can't have been cheap to invent and install all of this stuff, and I do think that being the company that's taking risks to innovate and try new solutions has to be applauded. I do also feel like plenty of people on board probably left the train well rested and considering it good value for money, and that that maybe will be me someday too if I ever make a second attempt and come armed with my own pillow and some knowledge of what to expect and hopefully don't get placed next to the drunks. I hope of course did have a better time than if I had to sit up in a seat all night, which is something I also did this winter when I took this train right to the far eastern end of Anatolia in winter. That was a 30 hour train ride all the way across Turkey and I couldn't get a bed on board so I had to sit up in the cheap seats all day and night. And if you want to see how I survived that, you can watch this video next.